Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from wherever you're joining us on cyberexchange.ca. You would have heard in the previous sessions the emphasis on risk, understanding risk, talking about risk, and at the same time, being able to know how you measure digital transformation against different barometers of risk. More importantly, you would have understood from all of the CISOs that we had, starting from Sarah Qureshi all the way to Bill Harmer, the importance of being able to communicate, not just with words, but through different awareness campaigns, and more importantly, through timely, effective procedures. Most of our guests were talking repeatedly about the aspect of knowing how to take a problem and ensure it doesn't become an emergency. And there's an art and a skill to that. In this session, we're going to be focusing on crisis communication. And I ask you to look up the definition of the word crisis. Crisis not only refers to a moment of danger, but it also refers to a moment when a decision has to be made that could be life-altering. Especially when it goes to a public environment, especially when it's in the hands of a couple of few who have understood the crisis, not only do they understand that they're in a danger, they understand that they need to make some form of decisions. Now you've heard me say this a couple of times, that communication is 20% what you know and 80% how you feel about what you know. And my guest today is someone who's had tremendous experience both in public and private sector, and somebody who feels very strongly about giving back to the communities that she works within. Before I introduce her, all of you know me as Ali Hirji. I'm the lead on the Cyber Exchange Advisory, and you're joining me live from the beautiful St. Francis Center here in the town of Ajax. This location uh, is the land of the peoples of the Mississaugas of the Scugog Island First Nation, protected and governed under the Williams Treaties. I want to thank Mayor Sean Collier and his team for making this space available, and the team at CyberX for collaborating closely with my team at Durham College to make such innovation happen, and for us to experience what communications is going to look like in the new normal. My guest today is a good friend, someone that I've looked up to, and someone that I've engaged with on numerous initiatives. Christy Honey is the CAO, the Chief Administrative Officer at the town of Uxbridge, a municipality here in the region of Durham. And I think her engagements with you today will get you to realize that remember when Kennedy said that in a crisis, you must not only see the danger, but also see the opportunity. I think she's going to open our eyes to all of the opportunity that this crisis, the pandemic, has brought us to. Christy, Welcome to uh, Cyber Exchange, and thank you for your time today. How are you? Thanks, Ali, and thanks to the town of Ajax and also to Cyber Exchange. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm doing great. Christy, I said earlier on that uh, it's 20% communications, that is, 20% what you know, 80% how you feel about it. In this situation, in the pandemic, you've obviously had to have communications well in advance. We knew in January that something was brewing. We started to see measures in New Zealand. We started to see measures in different European unions where governments were taking active steps communicating what they needed to do in order to stem the, the spread of the virus. For you, when did those communications begin? Uh, so uh, being new to the municipality of Uxbridge, uh, you know, really in January was, as you said, when we started to hear in North America that this virus was beginning to develop and that it could hit uh, North American soil. So as early as February, uh, I started taking actions and preparing and continuously updating our crisis communication plans. Now, you mentioned that uh, you started looking at global affairs and started realizing that, you know, the virus was spreading and you started to put together a communication plan. We talk about this as a crisis communication plan. Can you talk to us about what's the difference between just issuing out a communication and issuing out a communication with crisis before communication? Great question, Ali. So I think in terms of a crisis, it's all about being prepared. Uh, we have emergency response plans. We have communication plans associated with projects and different initiatives. Uh, but when you're in a crisis, you can take that binder or you can take those um, 
pre-written holding statements and communications, but you have to really quickly adapt based off of the limited information that likely you have available to you. And so I think when we're talking about crisis communications, it's, you know, you'll be prepared, you'll have everything that you've done in preparation for that crisis, but now it's about executing on what you've prepared for. And I think we've often spoke about this aspect of that, you know, you may know uh, a whole bunch of uh, technology skills, but it really is about how you execute on it. And often we find that when it comes to communications, a lot of us, and I've said this before, are, are listening to reply and not listening to understand. From your perspective, who had to be at the table to begin with in order to get attention to the fact that a crisis communication plan is being put together? Who were the stakeholders that you had to have around you to get the ball rolling? So I think any good crisis communication plan will have all of the essentials, some of the basics, you know, your pre-written communications, uh, your templates, your stakeholder matrix that's going to outline who you're communicating with in which order, which is really important, yep. and how. Um, and making sure that you're considering all of your demographics. So, um, you know, all of your audiences, including some of the marginalized or hard to reach audiences. Um, it's all going to be really essential in terms of developing that crisis communication plan and really taking the time ahead of the crisis to put thought into who you need to communicate with, when you need to communicate with them, and how you're going to communicate with them. Time is at uh, the very nucleus of what we do when it comes to communication. Help us understand and peel through the layers a little bit here. When you're sitting in the position of a government organization, uh, yourself, both as the chief administrative officer, but with a very intense and robust cybersecurity uh, background as well, when you look at it in terms of what has to be communicated on, you've got stakeholders that are business representatives, you've got stakeholders that are citizens of the community, seniors, young children, etc. Where do you start from? Do you start from let's fix our own shop first, which is our internal operations within the town, and then look at how these impacts every other layer of our community? Or is it a effort where you're talking about everything at one shot? I think it depends on the nature of the crisis. If I use the pandemic as an example, at the township, as we started to see the COVID-19 hit North American soil, and we saw it to be a risk to our community, we engaged uh, the department heads, we engaged their managers, and we went down even to the supervisors of operations, and we brought everybody together to contribute to taking our crisis communication plan and adapting it to this potential crisis. And I think that was actually one of our key um, items to success, factors to success, was making sure that we engaged people that had boots on the ground and were out in the community working with our residents so that we could adapt the plan to this crisis. I think if we hadn't have done that very early on, we wouldn't have had such a robust plan moving into um, the crisis as it further developed in March. You know, crisis communication at the very heart of it is this idea that it's not about talking to people, but getting people to talk to each other. It's less about, you know, top bottom, and it's more about getting everyone to bring their expertise to the table to basically contribute to that plan. Who's the owner of this crisis communication plan? And I ask that because when you look at the title communication, uh, many organizations now, and, and I, I guess you'll talk to us a little bit about the town of Uxbridge, but I'd imagine many organizations have uh, an individual or groups of individuals that are in charge of communications as a practice. But when it comes to crisis communication, the CAO, the security folks, take a very strong role in it. Can you tell us a little bit about the town of Uxbridge, how you sort of put together and came to lead the crisis communication plan, but more importantly, which other roles within the town had to feed into this very immediately? Uh, so we certainly have a management control group, which is a part of our emergency management plan. And that group convened early, um, in addition to the other meeting that I had spoke about to um, talk about operations and what we were going to communicate internally, externally, to council, uh, to our community and our residents. Um, our implications were broad reaching because we have the fire department. Uh, so personal protective equipment was absolutely essential in terms of our plan, as well as our um, all of our arenas, our um, our pool, all of our community services, um, 
So you can't just look at it with one lens. And at the end of the day, it all does come up to, to me as the CAO to make sure that we're executing the crisis communication plan and doing what needs to be done and advising council and getting the authority and decisions from council in a timely manner. Um, all of that, sometimes in a slow moving emergency, you have the benefit of time to take a very thoughtful approach as was the case in some of the early days of this pandemic. Um, in other emergencies, you need to make sure you know what your authority is. And that's really one of the key messages I would say uh, in terms of crisis communications is know your authority, uh, know who has the authority to release what communications when and to who. Um, because in a fast moving emergency, sometimes you don't have the luxury of time to confirm that. Yep. So let's peel this back a little bit. And now we've sort of got a good framework of the town of Oxbridge, multiple roles within it, uh, not a large municipality per se. So um, as the case, an even large enterprise, but more so in a in a smaller enterprise, if we may call the township that one person wearing multiple hats. The communications person is also dealing with with other uh, faculties or with other uh, requirements at the town. Let's go back to this aspect of, and we can start from here, which is when you're drafting a crisis communication plan, especially uh, for a municipality, you're also doing this in line with other authorities. Uh, within the town itself, obviously to, to a degree, uh, a lot of decision making will fall under your purview because of the financial implications, because of the operational, the legal implications as well. But as a town, you don't operate as an island. There are provincial mandates to look at, there are federal mandates, and there are also best practices globally to look at. How do you take into account your own process of while you're communicating to your stakeholders, how do you make sure that your crisis communication plan is reflective of both uh, the province as well as the federal structures that we have? Great question, thanks, Ali. So certainly um, within our municipality, we have um, groups that break off from the management control group. So for example, my fire chief has meetings with all of the other area municipal fire chiefs, just as I had break off meetings with the, the regional municipality as well as all the other lower tier municipality CAO groups. So that's where your peer groups and your industry groups can be particularly valuable, um, just in terms of shared resources and, and in this specific um, crisis, making sure that there's alignment and that the communication is clear and concise um, across a large, broad demographic in terms of um, the entire region of Durham. I think if we did things very differently um, across the various municipalities, there could be confusion and uh, some of that broken telephone in terms of some of the crisis communications we wanted to get out to the public. Um, you know, in answer to the second part of your question, the provincially legislated um, aspect of this is absolutely essential. So again, going back to knowing your authority, uh, we very quickly pivoted at the Township of Uxbridge to host our committee and council meetings online. In fact, I think we didn't have to cancel one uh, committee or council meeting. We moved to Microsoft Teams very quickly, which had not previously been deployed, right. um, so that we could make sure that we were meeting our provincial uh, regulatory legislated compliance. Speaking of compliance, ultimately when you create a crisis communication plan, you have to start looking at what do you need to be doing in, in order to make sure that the lights remain on and more importantly, that you're still able to render services uh, as our previous panel was talking about in a seamless, continuous uh, manner. You know, there's a reason that we call it business continuity and not business contingency because really it's about almost if the populace not feeling that anything has gone wrong and they're still able to access the core essential services. But with that said, uh, there is an aspect which you talk about a great deal, which is this aspect of over-communicating. Too much being said and the risk of things getting lost amidst all of the noise. You have to take into account that our citizens, our stakeholders um, are nervous. They're in a sense of anxiety. They're in a sense of panic. What's coming next? How do you balance between knowing what to communicate, and more importantly, if it ever comes up that you're over-communicating, how do you then deal with it in a crisis situation? Um, so I think as a leader, you know, it's your job to stay calm and remain positive. The team's gonna look at you to gauge their reaction, and you're going to build um, trust if you're candid. 
And that means being open and transparent and admitting sometimes at the leader, as a leader that you don't necessarily have all the answers. And so my approach is always to communicate early, to over communicate. Yeah. And if I don't have all the answers, just state such, right? It's, it's okay to say more information to come. And as I, as I have more information for you, I'll share it accordingly. You know, the role of a leader is not just to tell you what to do, but to show you how to do it. And in this situation, you know, when you're, and we'll get into a little bit more of the security elements of crisis communication right now, we'll stay a little high level in terms of some of the challenges that have emerged with crisis communication. But as a result of this hyper digitization, uh, we had Neil in the previous panel say, you know, I don't uh, uh, work from home, I, I, I live at work. Uh, and it's, it's a very interesting kind of way to, in which to say that now, while we thought we wouldn't have, we'd be losing communications and connections, we're now hyper, hyper connected and communicating. How do you manage the expectations now that people have? Because as a leader, yes, you have the town of Oxbridge, yes, you have an institution, but then there's Christy Honey and you're recognized in the community from social media to consistent Zoom meetings, et cetera. How do you sort of manage to ensure that you are staying true to the crisis communication plan and making sure that we're, we're constantly updating whatever it is that we're communicating? So you have to lead by example. Um, as I said, I didn't necessarily always have all the information, but I wasn't afraid to hold a town hall or an all staff meeting and share what information I did know when I knew it. And I always have the goal to make sure that my team, my people, my organization, hears the message from me prior to hearing it. You know, or electronically. I think that makes it easier on supervisors as well and also helps fix that broken telephone. Yep. And I think this aspect of broken telephone one is one that I want to build up on just a little bit more. You know, we've gone on this very interesting journey where you've explained to us the moment when you realize that you need to activate a crisis communication plan. Uh, upon activating it, you then looked at all the stakeholders that you have to bring to the table. Once you looked at all the stakeholders, you then realized what needs to be communicated when in a secure, effective, and timely manner, a set uh, framework that you've created now to ensure that the community is aware. But now comes the aspect of, with communication, as we always retain, is that it's not a, a one-way kind of equation. It's two-way. There is follow-up that goes with that. There's checking in that goes on with that. How do you ensure that now that the communications have been issued, that the right kind of steps are being taken, not just by your own team, but by the community at large? How do you, what are your thoughts on that? So I think you need to vet. Um, the information that's getting out there. Uh, you need to listen. You need to stay plugged in to the various communication channels, uh, whether it be radio, whether it be in print, um, so that you have the opportunity to clarify. Um, our mayor has done an exceptional job with communications in that he has scheduled every Tuesday morning a placeholder on the radio. And that allows us to take a look at what conversations are being had based off of the information that we've disseminated and then clarify or answer frequently asked questions in a manner that is accessible to many diff de different demographics, which is also really important, particularly when you're talking about a, a broad, far-reaching emergency. Yeah. You know, we said that like in, in the world of security, um, communication is not just at the the center of what we do, it's at the, the north, the south, the east, and the west of everything that we do. And often, and we've had this come up quite a bit, is who do you share with is as important as what you share. In this crisis communication, and now I sort of want to sort of uh, pinch at your, your cybersecurity uh, background, which is, which is well respected and well revered, is how do you make sure that when you're drafting your crisis communication plan and you're issuing steps on how the community can stay protected, how do you make sure that this information, uh, at some times which can be confidential, 
doesn't necessarily get used by the wrong actors. And I'll give you a little bit of a context. In the previous discussion that we had uh, with, with Bill Harmer, uh, with Neil from TD, and with Maytel from, uh, from Israel and Tel Aviv, we talked about this idea that uh, the pandemic right now has resulted in a lot of organizations having to let go of certain folks. The certainty that you're speaking to someone today uh, is, is marred with the uncertainty that tomorrow, depending on fiscal situations, that individual may not be there. But for that period of time that they're there, they get, they're privy to certain communicative elements that uh, they could act on even outside of the enterprise. How do you sort of uh, maintain some sort of security around how much somebody knows? I think a lot of that comes to the training that you do ahead of any crisis. Um, you know, certainly non-disclosure agreements and your employment agreements are all really important. Uh, but many times folks are with us for many, many years and what you've signed at the start of your employment or even at the start of an, a particular initiative uh, isn't necessarily refreshed when you're uh, living a crisis. So. I think reminding folks, training them, running scenarios, um, doing tabletop exercises that talks to the criticality of confidentiality uh, and making sure that it's a part of the regular conversations, not just during a crisis, but when you're planning and preparing for a crisis and running those scenarios. Um, the other thing I would say is really important um, when it comes to crisis communications is when you have those pre-built um, holding statements or templated communications that maybe are sitting in your crisis communication plan waiting for a crisis to present itself, make sure that you have your legal department review those critical key statements that could be going out externally to make sure that you're covered. And I would also say it's really important you make sure you're insurer is also at the table um, because there are certain communications if they're not appropriate deliver, appropriately delivered could put you at risk of your insurability. Yep. And I think, you know, when we were discussing this uh, in previous sessions, but also uh, in engagements at the CISO Forum in Niagara Falls uh, or at Canadian Women in Cyber or even at the Global Cyber Olympics, we were talking a lot about, because at the time, I don't think crisis communication per se was being looked at from the lens of a pandemic, but crisis communication was really being looked at in the event of a breach and you have a couple of minutes in which to enact something or crisis communication where an unwanted actor is both in the physical as well as the virtual territory of a particular company. And over there, I still remember the statement, I think it was Jeff Dolly uh, who mentioned it um, from Cybersecurity Pulse, where he said, you know, when I think about crisis, I sort of think of it as that traffic light, right? The, the red, amber, and the green. And communications is really about you being in the car. You need to follow those rules, and there are certain times of the crisis where you implement certain communication practices. Which takes me to another question, which you just brought up, this aspect of you have to get what you're saying vetted out, and more importantly, you have to see if it's in line with certain standards and frameworks. In your practice, what frameworks have you adhered to when creating a crisis communication plan? A, are there any frameworks that are commonly established, or have you gone about, like most security practitioners, taking the best from different frameworks and developing uh, uh, a communication template with a Christie uh, you know, stamp of uh, approval on it? So I think most industries have standards. Certainly when I was in the nuclear industry, we were highly regulated and had uh, standards and frameworks that we adhered to. Uh, it's very much the same in the municipal sector. We have our emergency management plan and it is very much in line with what has been approved uh, by the province yep. and what we test and train and retest and prepare using. That said, um, you know, you want to run tabletop exercises that has every single department at the table um, over and above what maybe you have in your framework. Now that framework ultimately doesn't just apply to communications with citizens and internal staff, it also has an implication on business. And as you've seen, and you know, I'll, I'll try to make this as politically correct uh, as possible, um, a lot of businesses right now, especially in the service sector, uh, at least in phase one of the pandemic, and to, to a degree in phase two as well, have taken severe losses uh, and have taken severe hits because of the crisis that we're in. How do you ensure that your crisis communication plan not only reflects 
how we are supposed to be responding to the pandemic, but also how we respond to the after effects of the pandemic, one of which is shutting the doors and a loss of revenue. How do you take in that multiplicity into account? I think you need to engage the stakeholders so we can make assumptions as leaders, but you really need to sit down and listen. So we have committees of council uh, at our municipality. I know with other organizations, they have boards or other committees that they can engage with some of those key stakeholders um, with. Certainly for the Township of Uxbridge, we rely quite heavily on our committees of council. Um, and that being, you know, our BIA, our chamber, and, uh, and our networking groups so that we, and, and we did meet with them regularly during the course of the pandemic. In fact, I met with each of those groups uh, together, you know, weekly for uh, about a month and a half in the early days so that as a municipality, we knew what was going on with the businesses um, in, in our area. Um, I think that's really important. Otherwise, you make assumptions. And when you make assumptions, um, you make decisions that could be ill-informed. Yeah. I think that ill-informed piece is one that I want to, again, build up on. So when you mentioned that you know, you've got to get all of your stakeholders involved, I think it's key for everyone to remember is that crisis communication is not just activated at a point of a crisis. It really is reflective of your communication practices overall. Christy, I'm probably putting you on the spot here by asking you this, but did you realize that you were engaging more and more, let's say, with the chambers of commerce, the BIAs, et cetera, these groups and clusters of business? Did you realize that there was heightened engagement once the pandemic hit? Or has this always been your practice to be in close proximity to the chambers of commerce, the BIAs, and so on and so forth? So my, through the life of my career, I have always taken it upon myself to build those relationships um, prior to there ever being any crisis or any negative connotations to a conversation. I do that even with staff. I call staff on their work anniversary. I one-on-one -on -one pick the phone every single staff member in our organization. I call and just say, hey, thank you so much. You know, you've been with us five years today. Really appreciate all that you do. And I do that with all of the various groups um, that I regularly engage with. And, and some that I don't anticipate I'll have to engage with, but I take the time to build that relationship prior to there actually being a crisis. I think it's really important that um, you build those strategic relationships, whether it be peer or industry or employee uh, relationships ahead of there being issues, problems, or certainly crises. I would hope that every single, every single employee has engaged with me one-on-one uh, -on -one directly um, multiple times prior to you know, us having to problem solve together. I think that's really important on two factors. Number one is, and you've heard me speak uh, to our students at Durham College often where I've mentioned that um, you know, when you're looking at solving a problem or creating a solution, the first thing is to understand that problem before you go in solution. And, and you have to live through that experience of the problem, right? Um, many a time as I've quoted existentialist philosophers who repeatedly remind us, right, that uh, life isn't about uh, a problem that needs to be solved, but really a reality that you have to experience. And when you experience it together, it makes a world of a difference. We also say different stroke for different folk. And some folks do well with uh, communications uh, issued by phone. Uh, folks like myself, uh, you know, I'm good in person, I'm good by email, I'm good however, as long as you're communicating. But it's very difficult also to take into account the multiple or the infinite ways in which people now are open to receiving information from social media to emails to calls. And the pandemic has taken away our ability to engage through body language as well. How much of a challenge has it been for you to really adopt uh, all of your communications through the digital highway? I think we're lucky that we have tools like Zoom and Microsoft Teams because it does give us that visual, um, which I think is really important to be able to look at body language and nonverbals. Um, you know, but there's all other forms of communication, as you mentioned, phone, but even handwritten cards. So we're wow. talking about relationship building and building relationships ahead of experiencing a crisis. One of the things I do is handwrite cards as often as I can, thank you cards, or congratulate, you know, congratulations card, or wow, well done, you did an exceptional job right. with this to um, good work. 
So I think during a crisis, um, you know, we use the tools that are available to us. We have to be prepared in the event that they're not available to us, as we saw in some of the early days of the pandemic, bandwidth, certainly in the rural north was an issue. Um, so you need to plan and anticipate the unanticipated, know how you're going to communicate. But don't forget some of those traditional forms of communication that might be a lost art, like handwritten notes and cards, too. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, in, in a previous session, I quoted uh, Satya Nadella, but I think uh, you've just uh, responded to Satya Nadella in a very interesting way where he says, you know, our industry doesn't reward tradition, it rewards innovation. And, uh, and I think there can be a lot of innovation that uh, we've missed out on uh, in, in our traditions. And uh, sometimes going back to, to the basics and working with that in different ways is really what true innovation is. So, so thank you for bringing that emphasis back on tradition. We've got another 20 odd minutes left. And I wanna now shift gears a little bit into, you've, you've really brought together some of the soft social skills that you need in order to understand crisis communication. And I wanna delve a little bit more into some of the technicalities of this. One of the aspects is from a security perspective, the impact of a crisis communication. What do I mean by that? So let's, let's delve a little deeper into this, is that once you go into this realm of doing crisis communication, you ultimately activate other faculties within an organization. The disaster recovery folks, the business continuity folks, um, folks from various operations within the town that now have to think about ways in which they can sustain their services and continue it uh, in light of the new normal. How easy is it to have these conversations without necessarily sparking fear and without necessarily always thinking about how are we going to, to fund this? Often it's all about you know, financially what the implications are or something, but first we need to talk about it. How easy is it to have these crisis communications discussions with, uh, with key operational departments in an organization? Again, I think um, preparation is key. So tabletop exercises where you do have legal and finance and insurance and um, labor relations, right? If you've got unions and employee considerations um, all at the table when you're going through that training in those scenarios. I know in uh, my previous life, we held a really extensive um, tabletop exercise that opened our eyes to many of the things that we perhaps hadn't considered. And I think that's where the key learning comes and that gives you the opportunity to go back and refine and update your uh, crisis communication plans. So that's obviously, you know, in the preparation of and making sure that you're very well prepared. Um, the other thing I would say is really important and one of the lessons I've learned is having some of those vendor relationships already established and those agreements. You don't want to be negotiating um, for third party support when you're in a crisis. So right. talking about financial management in answer to your question, yeah. you should be engaging those vendors early, have statements of work with rates and agreements established at he ahead. You may even want to have a legal firm or a ransomware negotiator or a pub public relations firm uh, on hand, on retainer, um, ahead. Those are not items you want to be negotiating when you're in the midst of a crisis. You know, often we talk about the fact that uh, we have we have the skills for today, but we need the talent for tomorrow. And I guess that's very true of a CISO is that, and I've said this a lot, there's a big difference between uh, sight and vision, and you really need to have that vision of what's coming your way. Now I'm gonna weave in a bit of a question that's, uh, that's coming in here, but I'll, I'll sort of give my own uh, little, I'll add my own masala to it, if you will, and uh, see where this will take us. I believe, and I could be wrong here, and I'm open to learning on this issue, is that crisis communication is on one part, but we also have committees that in the past have been specific to pandemic planning. Although not common nomenclature, not something we talk about a great deal, I've learned from folks like Bill Harmer, who spent time in the insurance industry, or Michael Ball, for that matter, that pandemic planning committees uh, or pandemic planning communications is not something that's unheard of. Do you think that there's a difference between your general, and I say this air quotes, crisis communication and pandemic planning? Uh, yeah, I think, you know, there's been many lessons learned and hopefully organizations are capturing those lessons as they're developing through this pandemic so that they can debrief and improve their emergency response plans and communications. 
again, I go back to this idea of a, um, you know, fast moving, you know, if you have a cyber breach or a ransomware incident, um, you know, if your public website's been defaced or you have something that's very publicly facing breach disclosures, those are fast moving incidents that you don't have the luxury of time to respond to. And so it really is all about being very well prepared and, um, you know, testing and training and running scenarios so that when you experience it, uh, everybody knows what they're supposed to do and how they're going to do it. With a slow moving emergency, which I would say this pandemic uh, certainly is a slower moving uh, over a much larger, longer period of time, uh, you do have the luxury to um, take a more planned approach and to refine some of the communications that you know that you're going to want to deliver. That said, in the early days, I think some would argue that um, you know information was fast and furious and changing by the minute. Um, but I think you know it depends on the nature of the scenario, whether it's a fast moving emergency or whether it's a, a slower moving emergency like a pandemic. Um, I would hope we're capturing lessons learned. We're going to go back. We're going to revisit. We're going to refine our plans. Um, certainly, this pandemic has also highlighted the over-reliance of technology, but also um, the interconnectedness of us as organizations. Um, and I think that interconnectedness in terms of this pandemic in particular is going to have us revisiting our plans and creating more mutual assistance programs and agreements um, so that we can leverage one another's resources when we're in the midst of emergencies. And I think that comes back to some of what you were talking about when it comes to strategic relationships. I think that aspect of strategic relationships features very heavily in who your stakeholders are, but also in terms of who's responsible for certain acts or processes that are being communicated through our crisis communications plan. Another question that's come in, and uh, we see this question coming quite a lot when it comes to business continuity, is who owns that crisis communication plan? If something has happened, uh, in this case, let's say the town, and, they, and uh, a particular protocol has not been followed, who owns it? But more importantly, if I may add to that, who basically governs that crisis communication plan? Christy? So I think, you know, we're all human and we're all experiencing increased, like heightened awareness, heightened stress as a result of the pandemic, working in formats and manners and many have never been challenged to do so in the past. So I think you have to be patient, you have to be forgiving, you have to be understanding and compassionate. Um, but at the end of the day, it does all in my organization roll up to our management control group, which has departmental representation from each department, including my fire chief. And that group all reports into me as the ultimate sponsor. And of course, I report into the mayor and to council. And with this particular pandemic, we made the decision to allow the mayor and a uh, few select councillors to also attend our management control group meetings, which is a little different than what we had planned in our emergency response plans. But I think it was a really good decision because it ensured alignment, especially as you talked about some of the financial implications. Uh, as we were making decisions as a management control group, it allowed the input uh, of the mayor and our chair of finance um, to provide input prior to us presenting the reports to council on some of the decisions that were made. And again, that went against our, um, our emergency management plan, but we, we made the decision given the nature of the pandemic and it's uh, been very effective for us. Yesterday, I was talking to uh, Mayor Sean Collier, and uh, I used this uh, one of his lines in the, in the previous uh, sessions that I was a part of, but I'll use it again, is uh, we're sort of in an environment right now, although less, less I wouldn't say necessarily less turbulent, but slightly less turbulent. Uh, he, he made a statement where he said, we're in a situation where uh, we're building the plane as we fly it. Um, and you know, you can, you can, in my opinion, you can work that in two ways. Uh, but his basic point was that you know we we know where we want to land, but we're just trying to figure out how how to get there as as we move along. And you want to really reduce the amount of damage that this uh, pandemic has caused to to various factors. But ultimately comes the aspect of timeliness. Now you mentioned that you know we went into this mode of thinking about the crisis as early as January. Um, I've sort of. Uh, 
held a school of thought that many of us for the first two to three weeks of January, at least in North America, were, were kind of ignoring the, uh, the, the bells of corona and were paying more attention to the war drums that were beating between uh, Iran and the United States and what implications that might have on gas prices and everything else. We sort of went into hyper mode with our communications immediately after uh, the school was schools were being told that they were going to close and that they won't be opening up again uh, for at least two weeks, and then that extended. What is the relevance of Ontario being in an emergency or a state of emergency to the crisis communications plan? Did it change it in any way? Was it heightened even more? How did that factor into the timeliness of your communications? Um, so I think for us as a municipality, um, the press uh, you know, federally and provincially was particularly helpful. Um, you know, everyone across the country and certainly the province of Ontario was getting access to the same information in a timely manner. And so as a municipality, we could dovetail off of those communications uh, to make it specific to our, you know, yeah. our municipality and our residents. Um, that certainly helped. Uh, in terms of streamlining the communications, also getting all of the CAOs onto a call every week. Um, that also ensured alignment across all of the area municipalities so that the residents in, in different municipalities weren't hearing different um, you know, key messages. Yep. And I think this aspect of what people are hearing ultimately brings us down to the aspect of when we're thinking through crisis communications, there is a process that is set in place. You set certain uh, timelines, you set certain frameworks within which you work to ensure that at this time, this communication goes out. You set certain times, etc. How did you work through that? Was it, we'll just issue out communications as something becomes relevant? Or did you set certain times to say, you know, we're going to post stuff, you know, 8 a.m. or 8 p.m. or whatever have you. How did you work that timeliness of the communications? Um, so in the early days, it was as information was becoming available. And so, uh, you know, I sent out an all staff communication and uh, said, you know, more information to come. We don't have all the answers yet, but we'll get them to you as this develops, uh, particularly as we started to shut down our facilities and uh, direct folks to work from home. Um, and then our management control group met every single morning at 9 a.m and we captured any key aspects of communications that were required as a result of the decisions that were being made. And we had our communications um, representative in those meetings. So she did an exceptional job of saying and reminding the group, okay, this decision's been made. This group, this group, this group needs to be communicated to how, when, who is gonna do the communications. And so, um, you know, we did have our stakeholder matrix already created in our crisis communications plan. So it was taking that and then updating it and refining it um, based off of the decisions that were in the early days being made daily. Then um, I hosted our bi-monthly all staff meetings and continued to host those throughout the course of the, um, the pandemic and, and continuing to do so as well as you know making sure that any other external communications are going out as they need to i mentioned dave's uh tuesday morning radio yep. program that's been really helpful particularly clarifying miscommunication that gets out there you know at the heart of communications is not just the technicalities of it uh it's as much a technical subject as it is a psychological an emotional and a social subject as well reading into another question that's come in here Part of crisis communication ultimately allows you or requires you, I would say, to look into some of the actions that need to be taken. One of the things that I can point you to is what I said earlier on is as a result of the pandemic and the crisis, certain individuals or certain groups of individuals, services have no longer been required. Certain um, certain instruments that you use or certain faculties and facilities that you use to render services have been shut. Uh, recreation centers is a good example, et cetera. How much did you have to also think about support resources when it came to building your crisis communication plan? For example, mental health support services or just general healthcare support services. How much did that factor into ensuring that not only is your crisis communication plan telling people what's going to happen, but also giving them support 
in the event of any other fallout? So one of the things we did at the Township of Oxbridge when we had that preliminary meeting with the department heads, the mayor, select council members, managers, and some of the supervisors that are on the front line, we also included a member uh, in our, our lead for our joint health and safety committee. Mm -hmm. And I'm really glad that we did that because actually she helped us make sure that in those early conversations and in those early all staff meetings, we actually shared information about mental health support, our EAP program, our um, paramedical benefits that are available to staff and encouraging folks to use it. I also embedded into those early communications, particularly for folks that had never worked from home before, to make sure that they take their breaks, that they get away from their laptops at lunch, yep. that if, if sunny day, especially in you know the dark days of March and April, that if you can take 20 minutes and go out front and kick a ball with your kids uh, because they're at home, that you take the time to do so. And I think that might have been uh, something that we did that was a little different than perhaps some municipalities. Um, I've got a lot of experience working remotely and from home. And so I was able to apply some of those lessons about um, even though, yes, we're in the middle of a pandemic and we're in the middle of a crisis and it's all hands on deck, your mental health, your health, your well-being is absolutely important for us to be able to weather this storm. And so that was a big part of a, my early communications was, you know, put away your laptop when you're able, walk away from the desk, get outside, go for a walk. We don't expect you to answer your phone the minute that it rings. We understand that you've got kids at home and that you have a family and that you're also trying to navigate this emergency too. Um, so I think, you know, it's really important that you have those representatives in those early meetings. By having that health and safety rep at that first meeting, she reminded me how important embedding that into everything that we did would be. And, and we, we continue to live by that. Fantastic, and I think it's it's crucial that uh, those who are drafting uh, ideas for um, for communications. I mean, it's an ongoing process. We've said this repeatedly. It's not a product. It's it's a work in progress at all times. Can be refined. Uh, taking into effect uh, or taking into account the social impact of how a message and the emotional impact of how a communication is received is, is so important, right? And you know, we often uh, emphasize Marshall McLuhan. You know, the the medium is the message, uh, but at the same time, you know, that's getting us to realize communications don't take place in a vacuum. And uh, people's state of mind when they're receiving these communications really needs to, uh, to take, uh, take effect because it's very easy to jump to assumptive conclusions. We've got another 12 minutes, and I'm going to sort of uh, take us through another two questions to see how uh, we, can, uh, we can unpack them a little bit further. You know, we always mention that uh, prevention, better than cure. Proactivity, much better than reactivity. Christy, there's lots of noise out there, lots of information about people talking about a second wave, people talking about quite recently about look at the amount of flights that are coming in from the US. There's a lot of noise and information out there. How do you structure yourself to ensure that you're listening or paying attention to the right items and basing your decisions on, uh, on information that can drive insight? How do you filter through everything that's coming your way? Uh, so I have my team of department heads, and they are seasoned experts. They are um, exceptional professionals that know their business very well. So I rely um, on them and their expertise and their advice. I don't pretend to know their business. And, um, you know, they are the ones with the teams that are on the front lines. So I think you need to make sure that you engage the right people um, for me, it's my department heads and then through them getting represented, representatives that are actually out on the front lines and making sure that we hear, you know, have their voice um, at the table. We have done that in a number of different formats. Um, and actually just most recently, I did a released corporate wide, a start, stop and continue. So what I did was put um, boxes out at every site um, where people can suggest to me, you know, as an organization or as a leader, what can I start doing? What can I stop doing? What should I continue doing? Um, to provide anonymous direct feedback um, to me as a lead as we prepare for what 
the remainder of the year might look like as we forecast ahead and also as we plan and budget for 2021. I think you brought up the next question very eloquently. I was going to delve into the financial implications of crisis communications, but you brought in the aspect of budget, which our audience clearly understands that uh, when working within a municipal environment, um, and even in enterprise as well, you have planning that happens. And uh, folks right now are not planning on a uh, on a quarterly basis. If maybe two weeks out and, and seeing where we land after two weeks, so on and so forth, you work with the information that you have. And Christy, let's take that a little bit further to sort of understand from a financial standpoint. The value of crisis communication, I would argue, is, is priceless. You cannot put a price on it simply because when I think of crisis communication, I don't think of it as, you know, we've hit the iceberg, now what do we do? It's more of, if we hit the iceberg, here's what we're going to do. We're not set to do that. We're not set for that iceberg, but if we hit it, here's what we need to be doing. Which takes me to this aspect of how do you then assess financially how to prepare in the event of a crisis. You're not only just looking at the operational, as the chief administrative officer, you have to look at what financial tools you can call upon. Is it just that we reach out to the provincial strengths that we have, or is a good crisis communication plan reflective of a budget that has these ideas in mind that if something happens, we have something to return to? Uh, so I think we're gonna see future budgets are gonna have pandemic and emergency yep. planning was embedded. Uh, that's certainly not something that we have done traditionally um, at our municipality. We have our reserves for emergencies, but actually looking at a budget and, um, you know, an operational or a capital budget and making decisions ahead of that budget year of where you have um, capacity is not a conversation that um, certainly in my tenure we have had. So I think future budgets are going to have scenarios uh, planned within them uh, to be able to make decisions in a more informed and planned manner. Yeah. Um, many of us were making projections, particularly financially, in the absence of information in this uh, particular pandemic. We didn't know how long it was going to go on for. We didn't know how long we were going to um, have to remain uh, at home. Uh, we didn't know when we would be able to reopen some of our facilities. Um, certainly as a municipality, our, we rely on our tax levy, but this really opened our eyes to how much we rely on non-tax levy revenue. Um, so I think you know our projections in the future uh, as we budget are going to have these scenarios in bake, uh, baked into it. And some of that analysis will end up in future emergency management plans. I think the parallels and the relationships between crisis communication and emergency management, uh, disaster planning, et cetera, uh, has become very, very apparent in what you've spoken about. And we'll sort of weave in the next question and then come to, uh, uh, come to our departure. And that is this aspect of not only do you find yourself now when you're drafting crisis communications plan, thinking about the budgets, but uh, more importantly now, you're also thinking about what some of the fallout might be. And what are some of the situations that uh, may result in, uh, you know, it's very easy for us to, to take shot at, uh, at, our, at our governments, uh, at our political representatives, et cetera. Did you have to find yourself sitting closely with uh, the mayor and, and council members to sort of talk to them about the fallout and, uh, and what they need to do in the event of any? Yes, uh, in regular daily, almost yeah. conversations with the mayor and certainly council uh, regularly as well. We had to make some very hard decisions early, which meant closing some of our facilities. It also meant laying off staff, uh, which in the history of the municipality, I don't think has ever happened before. But we chose to address the 2020 pandemic um, implications to our operating budget in 2020. We didn't wanna pass these costs onto future generations. And that meant making the really hard decisions this year to balance the budget this year. And uh, while we could have canceled capital projects or we could have um, you know, dipped into uh, some of our reserves, yep. that wasn't the plan. We, we really wanted to balance and that meant making the hard decisions. And that meant making sure that the mayor was on board, making sure that council knew what we were doing and um, making sure the public knew what the service level implications would be. Right. Um, you know, grass isn't being cut nearly as often. We have weeds in our downtown. 
it's um, you know not something that um, without the people you can necessarily support and so um, the public has been tremendously patient and understanding but again that all comes back to communicating so if they didn't understand the why behind it um, then there would probably be a lot more complaints. From a privacy perspective uh, many organizations do PIAs, privacy impact assessments. Uh, they look at uh, you know where they could be uh, breaching something or where they could be vulnerable if I can be more technical there. The amount of information you've now been getting about businesses that have been impacted, the stories, the narratives. I've always retained this, that you know, technology folks or security folks are very good storytellers, but also story listeners. You're getting a lot of data right now, and you're acting on that data. What is, and perhaps not true to a crisis communications question, but what have you been doing from a privacy perspective to ensure that whatever information that you're getting, um, are you looking at the, uh, anonymizing that data? Are you looking at various practices that you can ensure that resolution with the public that not only can you, they listen to you, but they can also, you can hear them in effective manners. Have you taken any steps from a privacy perspective? So privacy is at the heart of everything that we yep. do. While we are, um, you know, a municipal sector public entity, and so uh, freedom of information is really important, we are also bound legislatively by um, privacy provisions. Uh, so we take privacy very seriously, and we do training with our staff regularly. We do uh, data audits to make sure that uh, what we think is happening in terms of our business processes and in terms of the use and, uh, and um, termination of, of data is done based off of the procedures that we've created. Um, it's at the heart of everything that we do. You know, when you mentioned that at the heart of everything that we do and privacy being so central to making sure that people feel safe in order to share information with you, how do you now, as we go into the last two minutes, how do you now move from, you know, we've been in phase one, phase two, and now in phase three, when it comes to changing the crisis communication. There was a pre-crisis, which was you know the January period. There was, we're in the heart of the crisis. And now we're in this post, and, and I say it with crossed fingers, this post-crisis environment, numbers going down. We're in a new normal. How is this experience of the pandemic going to change the way in which you've been communicating uh, with the community at large? Will it change it at all? Or um, has it changed your process altogether? So we've certainly been capturing lessons learned throughout the pandemic and after we get to a point where our emergency order has closed, we will do an internal debrief. I think it's really important that we revisit um, not just our pandemic planning, but all of our emergency response, uh, including our crisis communications uh, to incorporate the lessons that we've learned. And then we can then incorporate that into future training uh, and scenarios and running more tabletop exercises. So I don't know that I would uh, necessarily do things, um, you know, broadly differently. I think we've responded to this very well. We adopted technology quickly. Um, we were one of the only municipalities not to miss a council meeting um, because we were able to deploy laptops with Microsoft Teams with everybody fully trained. Um, that's one of the benefits of being a smaller municipality. Um, is you can deploy technology quickly. Uh, that said, I know that there have been lessons that have been learned and I know that we've been capturing them regularly as a management control group and we will absolutely be revisiting them and baking them into our future plans. Christy, how instrumental has uh, not just the, the community at large, but you've mentioned quite a bit about you know, seniors in the community. Uh, you've mentioned young kids as well, you know, engaging with the school boards. How instrumental has uh, the various teams that you have, the not-for-profits in your community, um, in ensuring that not only has crisis communication been effectively communicated, but people have been taken care of? How essential has that social fabric been to the sustenance of a strong community in Oxbridge? I think it's been absolutely essential. So in the early days, the other thing we did when we closed our library was we created a seniors check-in program. So we had staff uh, and volunteers calling at-risk seniors to make sure that they had 
everything that they needed. And it wasn't just about, do you have groceries? Um, it was also a connection for them. So that was some of the feedback we received really early on is um, that program was tremendously successful because there were seniors living alone that used to be out in their community and that was how they, um, they connected. And now they're being told to stay home and they're at the highest risk group. Um, they felt very alone. And so that program, I think, really helped with that connection. And actually, um, you know, some of those volunteers chose to take on even more hours because yeah. they, it was rewarding for them, too, to yeah. have that connection and develop those relationships. You know, at the heart of crisis communications, as we come to the final minute, Christy, a lot of people look at, you know, what's the template that I need to follow? What are the checkbox elements that I need to make sure that uh, I've, I've ticked off? You've really exemplified the aspect that, you know, a lot of our speakers have said, you know, this checkbox security is, is very, very dangerous. Checkbox communications is just as much dangerous, right? And I think it's really fascinating to look at how a security professional like yourself uh, has now gotten into or is required to sort of be at the helm of care for the community. When we think about cybersecurity, we think about technical. We don't really humanize it. And I think you've done such a brilliant job in humanizing it and getting us to understand the multiple layers that go into the world of cybersecurity. Cyber sure starts with the C, but so too does community. And you've really explained that to us really, really well. So I thank you for that. I'm going to make some concluding remarks and then wish you adieu. To our audience that paid attention, I hope that you've realized very quickly that not only is crisis communication um, not a science, it's truly an art. Um, and it's one that I don't necessarily think you learn through trial and error, but it's one that you learn collaboratively. It's one that you build through community. And it's not something, as we've mentioned before, that's a product. It's a work in process. I really took from this experience two important things. Firstly, the necessity to realize that crisis communication is not about announcing that there is a danger, but it is about issuing a warning. It is about getting us to proactively be forewarned. You know the statement, forewarned is forearmed? That's at the heart of crisis communications. And more importantly, listening to someone like Christy, you really get the sense of, uh, you know, you measure a person by, not by anything else that they do, but by how they treat other people. And that's at the heart of what Christy does. Her care for those around her, her giving back to the community, et cetera, really shows you the pivotal role that cybersecurity professionals play in today's society. And I hope that if you're considering a career in cybersecurity and you're considering the best practices uh, that should inform your business continuity and your cybersecurity practice, you read uh, a page from the book of Christy Honey. Christy, thank you so much for all of your time. I know we've been engaged on numerous things. I know how effective and busy you are, so I do appreciate you taking the time on my request to engage with our audience. I wish you the very best, and I look forward to engaging with you very shortly in all of the other initiatives. Take care, Christy. Thanks, Sally. Pleasure.